All right. Good uh, afternoon, or if you're on the West Coast, good uh, morning. Uh, this is this is uh, something that I have been touching on. If any of you have been listening to webinars I've been on or things I've been writing, I want to go a little deeper into it. Um, it and the reason I, I'm paying so much attention to this is I think it is almost, I hate to use too, too much bravado, but almost revolutionary and it's brand new. Um, and bear with me if you've heard me tell this little background story for those that haven't. Um, because all I do is try cases now. I don't work them up anymore. I have, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't do well with idleness. I need to stay busy and productive. And so when I couldn't go to trial, I thought I'm going to talk to every one of our PI lawyers and premises lawyers individually on the phone to try to help do some problem solving and, and on individual cases as well as, you know, more global issues. Um, and since then, I moved on to other departments, you know, I'm, I'm product liability and, and, and business, we call it business trial group, which is contingency fee business disputes and uh, uh, employment law and other departments. But what came out of this just being washed over with the same things, talking to our PI lawyers, um, I knew this, but I had a brand new perspective on it, having one phone call after another, after another, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, take a break at lunch all the way to 5.30 is the last one, um, five days a week, and it took a month to run, run through everybody. And what dawned on me, the more I was saying, look, there's, quit worrying about that, that there was a profound shift from the way I had been talking about it then to the way I perceive it, and now to, to the way I'm trying to pass this epiphany on to others, which is in your typical car crash case. And I know some of you folks do med mal and other things. Um, and on another webinar, we'll talk about some of those, but I'm, this time I'm trying to share this new thing that has such, most lawyers do do car crashes. So it has such a broad usefulness and, and, my language, how I would talk about it in the past, everyone knows, you know, most of you probably know, don't eat the bruises, my book, and a bruise is just a blemish on a case, and all cases have blemishes. And the idea is don't chomp blindly into the bruise, cut it out, work around it, deal with it. Um, so I would use the term problem. And I would say I'm a problem solver at my, at, you know, I'm an inventor, a trial lawyer, and a problem solver. But it dawned on me so many of the problems, perceived problems is my new phrase, perceived problems in car crash cases were never problems to start with. They aren't even really bruises. Now, does that mean we just put on blinders and ignore it? Of course not. We still deal with it. But there's a profound difference between dealing with a problem in recognizing there's certain facts that just come along with this type of case and we need to deal with them. It's not fixing a problem. It's dealing with a fact of life. If you practice in this area of these car crash cases and herniated disc cases, it's a matter of just recognizing certain things come with those kind of cases. They just do and we'll deal with them, but they're not problems. And you say, okay, Mitnick, but what's the difference? If you're gonna deal with it either way, who cares what label you're, why are you so excited over label? If it's a problem to be fixed or not a problem, but you're gonna deal with it, what the hell's the difference? You're still dealing with it. And I'll tell you what the difference is. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the dealing with it. But there is a profound shift. It's an attitude shift. If you got a bunch of car crash cases and they've got, all have gaps in treatment, not a lot of visible property damage, prior crashes, aggravation of a prior injury, subsequent injuries. Your client doesn't really look hurt, so they, their Facebook uh, posts always are problematic seemingly. And if they surveil them, they're always looking active and, and healthy looking. And I don't mean a surveillance where they catch them you know, saying I can't do it and there they are doing it. I'm talking about the surveillance that's consistent with everything they've said, but you watch it and you go, boy, they sure don't look hurt. 
And we look at those and they're in all, to one degree or another, sometimes all of them are in our car crash cases, our herniated disc type cases. So what do most people, one thing I learned talking to our lawyers, so many of them, they don't say it to me because no one wants to, you know, have me dis be disappointed, but there is an overall feeling I could just sense of people saying, gosh, I wish I had better, better cases. And if suddenly I can take like a big eraser and, go, and erase all those problems, perceived problems in one fell swoop, look, you would suddenly look at that exact caseload and say, my cases just got better. They're not riddled with problems so that I'm frustrated working on them and I wish I had better cases and you know, it's not as much, not, not as fulfilling and I'm not gonna fight till the end to get maximum dollar because look, the case has got problems and I sure don't wanna try that case. Even if Mitnick says he's got fixes, for God's sake, can I just get cases that don't need to be fixed? And if you suddenly say, I love my cases and I didn't change a case. Now, of course, everyone would like to say, if I had all death cases and catastrophic injury cases and everyone's in a wheelchair, not that anyone would ever wish that on people, but if it happened, why couldn't that case come to me? Well, that's a different discussion. But look, there aren't that many of those cases. No one is gonna fill their inventory with those cases. So what you do fill your inventory are people that have a absolute righteous claims and need a lawyer, and there are a lot of car crashes with herniated disc cases. So if you've got a bunch in your inventory, what if when I'm done, you could honestly say, these aren't problem riddled cases. These are good cases. I really like my caseload. I treasure each one of them. How much difference would that make as to your personal fulfillment, coming to work, killing yourself, working them. Because look, we all know how hard this work is. We, you, this, this isn't for the weak of heart. And if you're going to pour your soul, your time, chunks of your life, don't you want to do it on cases that you treasure, that you feel are gems, that are worthy of everything you've got, instead of going, I'm going to work it because I'm a worker, but Woo, I don't know, I'm crazy about this case. That is a fundamental shift. Even though you still are gonna have to address issues because guess who still thinks they're problems? The defense lawyer. Guess who's gonna try to make them look like a problem? Defense lawyers. So we can't ignore them, but we can wake up in the morning and go, I love my caseload. There's nothing wrong with my caseload and I'm enjoying working on it. And you aren't gonna get me to settle it cheap because I don't think it's a discount, damage, compromise case anymore. And I'm not scared to take it to trial. I'm not saying, gosh, everybody's talking about go to trial. I gotta have a case worth going to trial on. I don't, yes, you do. Now I'm not saying there aren't problems in cases, for God's sake there are. Your client swears they've never had a crash before, never have been treated for back problems before, and you find out a week before they were totaled their car and went to the emergency room and had MRIs and then went to the neurosurgeon. And you go, well, you just swore. And they go, well, I forgot. Oh, a week ago, you forgot it. A week before the crash, you forgot. I mean, that's a problem. I know of a case where someone swore they couldn't work, they couldn't work, they couldn't work, and they got Reddick records. He was being paid off the books out of state by a friend and never missed a day of work. That's a problem. That's a problem. I had a client once with RSD swore she couldn't even get in the shower. She couldn't lift a brush to brush her teeth. And they had her on surveillance carrying a big old thing, a, a, a tub of beer on the, on the beach. Guess what? That was a problem. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about Things like gaps in treatment, not a lot of visible property damage. You look at the pictures and you go, hey, the repair bill's $400 and looks like a scratch on the bumper. Or my client already had an injury and this is just an aggravation case. Or my client had two or three or four prior crashes 
or incidences. Maybe had one after a subsequent, you know, and, and, and then on top of that, they, you know, they got all these Facebook things and they sure don't look hurt. They're on a ride going, wee. And you go, gosh, why can't I get, here's my answer. You know why you can't get a herniated disc case that doesn't have some of that in it, if not all? Because those are herniated disc cases. Almost occasionally have one with nothing. A 25 year old never had a problem in their life. Got in a crash, went to the emergency room, treated consistently, treated to the day of the trial, had nothing before at all, total clean slate, never had anything after it. And the property damage, they totaled it. Okay, they exist. But you're not going to see many. So you're in the same boat with everyone. But now let's say, okay, that's a little comforting. Misery loves company. We all got the same damn problems. They think it's still a problem. No, that's where, that's the epiphany. And I'm not, please don't think I'm looking down at you going, no dummies. I'm not thinking at all unless I'm saying I'm a dummy. This is this realization they were never a problem to start with is new to me. And I'm just, my pants are on fire to share it because I do think it gets to the root of your happiness and your effectiveness and your joy in working the cases and your willingness to take them to trial and say, get lost, you trying to shortchange my client, you cheapskate lawyer on the other side. No. And I'm bold and I'm confident because I realize this case isn't riddled with problems. It's a good case. I'm proud of it. I love it. I'm glad I got it. I'm grateful. That is a fundamental change. Now, I want to show you why this isn't misery loves company, but they are problems. They're just not problems. And I want to go through and, and, and show it to you in a way that I got there because I am confident when you hear me finish this, if you really go into it with an open mind, you're going to go, I'll be damned he's right. They aren't problems. And if when I hang up, you feel that way, then I'm going to sleep Friday night with the, my heart swelling to have truly passed something worthwhile that it can have global impact on the passion for what you do and the fearlessness to take many of those cases to trial or say, pay me or else and mean it. So let's go through it. And the, here, the big picture phrase I was on, I walk every morning over here at the beach and all this stuff. And I'm fortunate to live on a beautiful strip here. And I get up when the sun comes up and I walk and I do a lot of my thinking out there. I do my prayers halfway on the walk and the other half I'm processing and dealing with stuff. And it dawned on me walking, knowing I was going to be doing this, that a great phrase for this is beauties in the eyes of the beholder. <coughs> Excuse me. Beauties in the eyes of the beholder. And we all know what it means. We all know the story of, you know, the beauty and the beast. The big beast really was the prince or the prince and the frog. And you kiss them, the frog becomes a prince. These cases that seem like frogs, that seem like beasts, are princes and princesses. And so I love the overarching phrasing of beauties in the eye of the beholder. And I'm now talking to the beholders and the ultimate beholders are the juries. And we're going to be able to take these concepts I'm talking about to you first. First, I want to talk to you personally, privately, no jury around, but all of these concepts then can be converted into the eyes of the ultimate beholder, which is the jury. So let's start with the classic example is a gap in treatment. I had a lawyer, one of the, our lawyers say, you know, Keith, I know you got, all right, I think it was a younger one, said, I'm Mr. Mitnick, I know you got, um, I know you got answers for gap in treatment, um, and I think they're brilliant, but, but I got to ask you, man, this is a big gap, this is a bad one, and I just, I don't know what to do about it, no one wants me to settle it, but, and I said, well, what, I'm thinking he's going to tell me 10 years or something, like the case has been continued for decades, and he goes, it was a year and three months. I started laughing. I said, that's not a big gap. That's a gap. I said, if it was much less, it wouldn't be a gap. <laughs> For God's sake, that is a gap. So let's talk about it. And I started this, that particular lawyer, who's a sharp young lawyer, is going to be great. 
and he does great work, but he was angsting over this, you know, over a year gap. And he's not, when we ended, he's smart enough. He instantly got it, said, I'm embarrassed to say it. Don't be, I said, don't be embarrassed. That's how a lot, most people feel. Just go forth, bud. And he goes, I got it, man. He was just, he could have run through a wall when we were done. And it, it was a big part. It was, there were a lot of parts, but it was a big step in the direction of what I'm wanting to share now. And here's what I ended up telling him. I said, let me tell you why it's not a problem. It's not a problem. He goes, man, I, I hear it. I said, just listen for a minute, damn it. It's not a problem. Okay. And I paused for effect. He goes, why? I said, I'll tell you why. What is the fundamental basis for why a gap in treatment is relevant in the case in such a big problem, perceivably? What's the only relevance at all to suggest if you weren't going to the doctor, you weren't hurt? You got better. You healed. It was just a sprain strain. And our smoking gun is you got a gap in treatment. And they say it like a dirty word. Gap in treatment. You shouldn't say that in church. It ain't a gap in treatment. It's just a period of time your client wasn't going to the doctor. Why is that fundamental flaw? And guess what? Think back how many times you've been to court in front of a jury where they actually said the relevance of the gap is the reason I'm making such a big deal. The reason I have this, this big blow up of a calendar with dots when they went, no going, and then a dot or two right before trial and like a year in the calendar in between and I painstakingly have spent all this time talking about it. How many times have they said, let me tell you why that matters. It proves they're not hurt anymore. It's proved they're healed. It proves no pain. How many times have you heard it? Think. They don't. Trust me. I tried, you know, one to four trials when we're not in shutdown a week in a bunch of car crashes. They don't. Not ever, but rarely. Now ask yourself, if it is their big smoking gun or one of them, why wouldn't they say what they mean? Why hint? Why hint? Here's why. Because the fundamental basis of the gap in treatment being this big deal is a false premise. It's a totally flawed, false premise to its core. Why? Because the premise is no doctor equals no pain. If you're not going to the doctor, you're not in pain. If you're in pain, you're going to the doctor. And therefore, if you're not going to the doctor, I can rule out that you're in pain. No doctor, no pain. That's a false premise. How do we know? How can I say it with like, gusto. Well, I got back problems. Back problems. When's the last time I went to a doctor for my back? I know I had all my hair and that was a long damn time ago. I'm 61. I lost my hair in my early thirties. Oh shit. No doctor, no pain. Why? I'm going to sit back like I want to. I don't need these things. I'm cured. How stupid is that? How many of you have had pain that lasted a long time? Did you camp out at the doctor and stay camped out at the doctor? When you didn't go to the doctor, did it mean no pain? Of course not. What if you ask the jury in jury selection? How many of you have had pain that lasted a long time, either chronic, permanent, or just lasted, seemed like forever? Bunch of hands. How many of you went to the doctor? I'm saying you're back. How many of you went to the doctor? Or just say pain, period. And I don't mean like a pain in your side of your chest when you ran to the doctor for 
you know, thinking you have a heart attack. I'm talking about some kind of skeletal pain, muscular pain. How many of you went to the doctor? You're going to see hardly anyone. That very few are going to raise your hand. The ones that do, ask this follow-up. When you went to the doctor, did you find out there wasn't much they could do to cure it? You're going to have to ride it out, or maybe there was, you couldn't get rid of it. They could you know, help you deal with the lessen the pain, but they couldn't cure it. There was no cure. How many of you heard that? You're going to get a lot of hands. Um, when you heard that, did you go keep just going anyhow? They're going to go, no. Say, well, for those of you that didn't go to the doctor and those of you that went, found out there wasn't a real cure and quit going, how many had your pain disappear? Just poof, gone, the minute you quit going to the doctor. Just quit, no doctor, no pain. How many would say that's what happened? They're going to look at you like you're nuts. And they're going to say, no. Huh. So you, you, you're not saying that the fact you weren't going to the doctor means the pain disappeared. No, not at all. Okay, good, good. I'm not surprised, but good to hear that. You've just blown there out of the water. Ask yourself, have I had pain? Did I go to the doctor? If I did and found, you know, look, if they give you an injection, it went away, great. But if it, there's nothing like that, we just fix it. Did you keep going? And it didn't mean the pain disappeared. No. The fundamental premise of the entire gap in treatment is a lie. It's flawed from the inception. How can it be a problem when it's a reality? And then what do they do with gap in treatment? They take the false premise, no pain, no doctor, no equals no pain. And then they make this light leap of logic that it just is ridiculous, which is this. Okay. Starting point is you went to the doctor and you went a bunch and then you quit. So that must mean we can rule out you're in any pain. You're gone. You're fine. The pain's gone. You're healed. No more problems from that crash. But then you went back to the doctor close in time to trial. And therefore that must be new and unrelated, or maybe you're making that up. Or maybe you had another secret injury that you haven't told anyone about. But one way or the other, that's a brand new problem. That's got, or no problem, just made up. Or a new problem, but it's got nothing to do with this problem. Why is that ridiculous? Because it came back in the same joint, in the same place in the joint, and it's the exact character of pain. What are the chances you were in a crash, had pain of a precise character and location on your body, it went away, and eight months later, a year later, a month, a year and four months later, it reappeared in the exact place and feel. But it's got nothing to do with this. It's just a big coincidence. That's asinine. Because there's another explanation. You go, of course it's the other one. The other one is, it never went away. It's in the same place, in the same joint, and feels exactly the same because it's the same pain from the same injury. It didn't disappear. Just be, and look, no one says it disappeared, by the way. Who the hell says it disappeared? What witness says it disappeared? Your client says it didn't disappear. The doctor she went back and saw says it didn't disappear. The before and after witnesses say it didn't disappear. Their hired neurosurgeon who comes in once again on their behalf doesn't say it disappeared. Who the hell says it disappeared? No one. The defense lawyer doesn't say it disappeared. You know why? Because he never or rarely connects why he's making a big deal out of gap in treatment. Because he knows it doesn't add up. He knows if he goes down that path, he's going to be exposed. It's a trick. So they throw it out there and hope the jurors say, fraud, phony, something's up, I knew it. Gap. Except we expose it. And all of a sudden you go, that's bullshit. There's nobody says the pain went away. And you, defense lawyer, don't believe in enough to say it. 
you're just hitting it. And remember this wonderful phrase I came up with a couple of years ago. I just, I overuse it probably. The courtroom is not a place for hinting. It's a place for saying what you mean and backing it up. And if you're not going to, don't believe in it enough to say it and back it up, then hush up. And if you don't want to be that aggressive, you can just leave it at courtroom is a place for saying what you mean and backing it up. But they're just hinting. It's not a place for hinting. This is a hinting defense. And there's a reason they're hinting, not because they're shy, because they understand it's fundamentally, fatally flawed, and they don't want to go down the path where logical catch them that it doesn't add up. But guess what? We can... Folks, they're going to talk about gap in treatment. Now you tear their gap all down because you point out. Here's, so let me, let, I, before I go there, let me complete this. So why did your client go back? All right, now we understand it's not fair to say no doctor, no pain. But, you know, I'm a jury and I am a little troubled. Why did your client suddenly go back close in time to trial? And why did they quit going? Well, the quit going is easy. They quit going because going to the doctor takes a ton of time. You got to drive across town. You got to go check in. You got to go sit and look at the magazines again, the same old magazines you're sick of. Then you get called back. You're still not done. You got to go away. You're still not done. You got to go back in the room and sit. And the nurse comes and you go, okay, I'm getting close. No, you're not. Nurse asks you questions, at least. Now you wait some more. Look up on the board of the body and look, there's where that thing he was showing me where the problem is. Finally, the doctor comes. Doctor does his business and leaves. Are you done? No, you still got to go check out. Are you done? No, still you got to drive across town. By the time you're done, every single visit is a, takes about a half a day. Who can just keep giving up half days? Why did they do it in the first place? Hope, hope of a cure. People will make huge sacrifices of time and effort when there's something that has got their life changed and there's hope of a cure. But at some point, that's where the gap quote starts. At some point, around the time they stop going on that calendar with all the dots, they got the bad news. There is no cure. You reach maximum medical improvement, you got a permanent injury. We can do things, you know, to make you feel a little better, but they're in the cure. And when hope for a cure is lost, people get on with the business of life. That's where the quote gap comes. And it's not a gap. It's just a point in time where your client realized they weren't going to be able to fix it. And they got on with life because they couldn't keep giving up half days over and over and over when there was no cure or fix left. It's just a period of time they weren't going to the doctor under the circumstances, not a gap. I wouldn't mind gap if they don't make it ugly, but they do. So it's not a fair word. They just weren't going to the doctor at that time period. So then the last question, but then why did they go back? If there was no cure, why go back right, you know, close in time to trial? Well, there are three great answers. Two, one of two is going to, but I'll do it that way. One of two is going to apply. And the other one is almost always going to apply. What is it? Either it got worse and your client had been going it alone and said, I need to try to get some help. Who knows? Maybe there's something news come out, but I got to get some relief. Or it didn't get worse. It stayed the same. And they just said, no cure, I'm getting on with life. But it's taking a toll. It's wearing them down. They were hoping against hope, even though they heard there wasn't a cure to start getting better. It hasn't. And it's taking a toll. And they need some relief. They need a break. They need some help. So they went back. And here's the third one. That treating neurosurgeon is going to come testify to you folks. We're bringing him as a witness to describe to you the injury, what caused it, and what the future holds. We've got an obligation to you to bring you the best evidence, current, up-to-date evidence. And for all the reasons I just described, my client hadn't been going. But if that doctor is going to come in here, we have an obligation to you for him to be up-to-date. 
So of course she went back so that he could do a recent, current examination, update his history, do new MRIs and workup so that we can bring you evidence that he can talk about her current state, not this is what I believe's happened, but I haven't seen her in a year. So you're dang right she went back to her. Now, why is it a problem? Honestly, is it really a problem? Now, we deal with it, just like I explained, we deal with it. But when you look at your case and your inventory, when you get up at the crack of dawn and you're down at the office about to, to grind another day, wouldn't you rather grind and say, all those gap cases in my inventory that I've lost sleep over, I don't give a damn about that gap. It's not a problem. It's the nature of the beast. If I'm going to do herniation cases, that's what it's going to look like. Now, should they be going more frequently because relief's better than letting it get out of control and build to where you're frustrated and ultimately have to go back? Sure. Would they be better off continuing to get, you know, relief, if not cure? Sure. If they did that, would it be one less thing to deal with the trial? Great. We're not doctors. We can't tell them what to do. We can tell them, look, this is what they're going to do to you with it. And it probably would, you know, make you feel better, but I can't get into your medical care. That's up to you. But if they do continue to go, great. But if they don't, that doesn't put that client in a, in a discount bucket. It just puts them in a life bucket. And it's still a really good case where someone really got hurt and they got hurt bad. And if justice is to work, the outcome ought to be a lot of money because it's a lot of hurt, not because someone hit the lottery, but because we believe in justice, that it's a whole justice, full justice, maximum justice, not some cheap discount justice. But it's not just the gap in treatment. What about a prior problem? What about a prior problem? Why do my clients all seem to have prior problems? Some prior crash, they've been to the chiropractor for a back problem, you know, they trip somewhere. Why do all my clients seem to be klutzes or crash, you know, demons, and they all got something in their past that I have someone with a clean past? It's not a problem. Guess why your clients have shit in their life happen to them? Because shit happens to people in life. Occasionally, we get a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old. They usually don't have priors. Okay. But all the rest of your cases, where someone's 40, 50, 60, 70, whatever, have they had a motor vehicle crash in the past? Your back is vulnerable. Who the hell is 50 and hasn't done something to their back? Who's 50 and hasn't been in a crash? My wife's a great driver. She's been in a crash. It just wasn't her fault. Someone hit her. I've been in a bunch of them. I don't think they're my fault, but they are people that <laughs> might have disagreed. But the point is, that's a fact of life. It isn't that your caseload is riddled with God almighty, no one else, but just me, poor me. No. If you're going to do car crash cases, you're going to have priors. Why does it hurt your value your case? If it's just a fact of life, it doesn't. It just doesn't. If your client had a crash, healed up, let's say just, I know some are three years ago, a year ago, some are 10 years ago. I'm just going to say five. Your client had a crash five years ago, went to the emergency room, went to the chiropractor. Maybe if you're lucky, they did an MRI. Maybe they didn't. In the MRI, there's no herniated disc. That's the greatest thing could happen in, in your case. Your value went up. You got an earlier MRI that shows the one after the crash you're on, you got a brand new finding. It wasn't there. I'd rather have that case than no crash before no MRI. 
Well, let's say they were in a crash and no one got an MRI. Well, guess what? It wasn't bad enough to get an MRI. Guess what? They did. We know what they do when they were in pain. They went to the doctor. Guess what? They quit going. Guess what? They've never gone back on like this. They're going to say, ah, there's proof. No pain, no doctor. No. The difference is we have all the other circumstances. Your client went to the doctor in this crash. There's no history of prior problems other than this one incident that went away. The doctor she was seeing there wrote, it went away. Your client says, I never had any problems with that after about a month. Her husband says it. Her friends say it. All of the evidence shows it went away. It's just the fact of life that most jurors have had, most of you have had, I damn sure have had, and it doesn't mean your case is in the discount bucket. Because you have a period of time, no injections. We know that because there'd be records. No manipulations at a chiropractor, no physical therapy, no MRIs, no doctor visits for pain, nothing for five years. Got in this crash, went to the emergency room and has pain that's never going away. And you can, MRIs don't lie, you can see them with your own eyes. There's the herniation. The doctors can feel the muscle spasms you can't fake. Common sense tells you that crash caused this. The physical CSI evidence, like the MRI, proves it and the juror can see it with their own eyes that don't lie. And nothing like that before. And if there is a film before, they're in the herniation. Why is that a problem? Do you deal with it like I, of course. But when you look at your case, now you go, I got a gap in treatment and I got a prior. No, <laughs> I got good cases. Of course, I've got priors. Of course, they're grownups. Shit happens to human beings in life. Of course, there's a gap. They got bad news. No cure. What if there's an injury in the past that didn't heal? Now I got the, the aggravation case. And those of you that are on my list or have gotten that recent um, brush stroke I sent out my at home but not alone brush stroke on it. Let me push a pause button there. I, I, I presume quite a few of you because I sent out to my list serve are on it. For those of you that aren't, one of the things that came out of this process where I was talking to all the lawyers, I normally go to New York City and I do what's called um, Mitnick's brush strokes. And we do audio podcasts. And I do one, I do a whole year's worth and we release them every month. And it's the new stuff like this stuff I'm excited about right now. And after I spent that month talking to all our PI lawyers, I had this whole list of stuff that I'm sharing within our office. But I think, gosh, I wish I could get on a plane, go up to New York to the studio up there and, and record this. But I can't. So what did I do instead? I said, I'm going to create emails, little nuggets at one page to every now and then. I'm working on writing one right now that's going to roll on a little maybe into the third page. But I try to keep them no more than two pages. Most of them are one to one and a half pages. And it's just all of these things I would be sending out as updates of hot new stuff, hot off the presses. And I figured out I can get them to people if I can just get folks to sign up for the listserv so I can get it to them. And I send them, they're called, I named them at home, but not alone, kind of a playoff home alone, at home, but not alone brush strokes. So if you do not aren't on it. If you will send an email to two places, me at, and I think they're going to send this, put this up at the end or send it out, but kmitnick at forthepeople.com. That's K-M-I-T-N-I-K. There is no C. Don't put C-K. Kmitnick at forthepeople.com. And that's F-O-R, not the number four. Kmitnick at forthepeople.com. And if you don't mind, if you would include on it, my assistant, Mary Arnold, which is simply M Arnold at forthepeople.com. So K Mitnick 
at forthepeople.com, M Arnold at forthepeople.com. If you include her, then it saves me. I'll probably respond to you. I, I, anyone asks, I like responding. I think it's a showing of respect if you care enough to ask. But I, then I don't have to forward everything on to her. And just say, I'd like to be included on your list, sir. And I will not only add you for the future, because I got a whole bunch more to come, but I've done eight. I got one in the hoppers coming out shortly, number nine. I'll catch you up on the past one, and you'll get all the future ones. So and what I'm doing here is another in lieu of going up to New York. This was another means to reach out where I could do it as a webinar for from our firm and me to you, where you, I can actually do a little more than just you know, a short little blurb. But anyhow, if you want on that, get on there. And one last thing, as long as I'm paused and talking about if you want things. If you don't have my book, it's called Don't Eat the Bruises. And that's going to be sent up at the end too. The reason I'd like you to consider getting it if you don't have it is this. Not that I need to sell it. The, the royalties are so small, they're insignificant. Trial Guides doesn't do it to make money. I didn't do it to make money. None of their authors do it to make money. We all do it for the right reason because we all believe in a rising tide lifts all boats. And I don't need to worry, gosh, I'm going to be embarrassed if no one buys it. I'm going to be ashamed. No, it's been a number one seller for Trial Guides for one of their top sellers for years now. So that's not my reason. I have one reason, one reason only. There is so much more I'd like to share. There is never enough time. That book goes from A to Z in trial, and it's all systems that can be reproduced by any lawyer in any case. It's not a bunch of war stories. It's not a one little narrow topic. It is truly a whole bunch of stuff that's easy to reproduce by any lawyer in any case in steps and systems. And I know if, you, if I say that and offer that, now it's up to you and I don't have to feel like, gosh, I feel like I shortchanged everybody because there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't cover. But if you're interested, go to Trial Guides, not Amazon because the price is higher there. Go to Trial Guides and put in the code. There's a discount code, Mitnick Morgan. Mitnick Morgan 5. Mitnick Morgan 5. If you put that in, there's a discount. Okay, enough of that. Now I want to come back to the aggravation. So instead of your client had a prior and it cleared, is it a problem if they had a problem in the past and it didn't, didn't cure, heal, go away, and it's still there on the day of your crash, so you're dealing with an aggravation case. Is that now a problem in a discount bucket case? No. Think about it. Why not? And when I go, no, once again, I'm not going... What are you thinking? This is evolution stuff. This is hot off the presses, new stuff, but I want to share it. But the answer is still now, no. Why? It's not because anybody's got problems. Like I told you, my back, my wife's got a back that's worse than mine. She carries on. She doesn't complain. You never know. You can't see it from the outside, but she does things in her life different. She takes a break. She still does, 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 but instead of does, 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 before she does breaks, does breaks, does, and has a busy day. And then she's on a heating pad and feeling miserable. Doesn't complain, never says a word, but I know it. If she takes it easy, she feels better. Some days for no reason is a bad day, but that's life. But guess what? Just like my back and her back, it's a baseline. It's been there so long, it's become part of your normal life. I've made adjustments, she's made adjustments. And it's a baseline. And would we both love to have be rid of it? Of course. Do we walk around moping about it and feeling like, gosh, my life's been changed? No, it's just, it is our life. It's okay, it's good life. Now someone come along, ram me, and drop my baseline from here. It ain't up here when I was 18, is here. But you take it from here that I, that's my normal. I cling to it. And you drop it down to here for the rest of my damn life. Is that a small matter? My baseline just got a lot worse forever. 
I got to readjust now, which is years of becoming accustomed. So you really, it is your base not nine, not damn it. What happened to me? In that new baseline, when you finally get there, is gonna be much worse forever. Why is that a discount? If that happened to me or my wife, we would kill to get back to there where we had the pre-existing. And by the way, you have this beautiful thing available to you where you can, if in those states where you can do board dire, where you talk about it, you say, look, we have some called as is justice. If someone hits someone, they're not in the prime of their physical life. They're not perfect specimens of health. They got wear and tear, bangs and bruises, health problems, maybe some prior injuries. Those people can get justice too and not discount justice. They can get full justice. I call it as is justice. When we, the constitution calls it justice for all calls it equal justice. I call it as is justice. We all know what as is means. You buy it off the user rack, you take it as is. You ram somebody who's got some years on them, you take them as is. They may be more susceptible. They may be more injured than someone who could have walked away if they were, you know, an 18 year old, you know, captain of the football team. But you take it as is and that person can get full justice even though they aren't in perfect health, which by the way, you're talking about the germs, most of them aren't in perfect health. And you say, that's the way that works. How many of you think that seems uh, fair, reasonable? Ought to be as is justice. How many of you don't like it? Think everybody ought to be in perfect health to get justice. No one's going to raise their hand. You're starting to lay the foundation. Now opening statement. Remember, folks, we talked about as is justice. Well, in the, there's a law here in our state called aggravation of a pre-existing condition. And that law is here because it recognizes how important protecting the rights of folks that aren't in perfect health are, that they can get full justice too. And we're gonna prove to you that my client qualifies for the protections of that law. And if they deny it, I promise you, we will present the evidence to you that my client had pre-existing conditions that qualify for the protections of that law. Now you just owned it. It's not an apology for a weak case. You qualified for protection like everybody else. And you say, yeah, but what about all those people got back problems on my jury and no one ever gave them money? Well, you separate it. You say, and this was thrust into my client's life by no fault of her own, unnaturally. It was thrust into her life unnaturally. It's almost biblical, sinful. It's a, you're, and those people go, I know it's a big deal to have this problem. But it, and if I didn't, and, and it is a big deal, and boy, if someone did it to me, rather than it just kind of happened over time, it'd be a big deal to me. I'd expect them to pay, and I'll pay a lot in fairness. So aggravation is not a problem. It's just not. And if you frame it right, it can actually be a strength. But regardless, you know what it never is? I don't pick it up and put it in the discount bucket that makes me wish I had a different case, a better case, and I don't enjoy working on it, and I sure as hell don't want to try it. So when settlement comes, I'm going to take the last best offer. No more. That got moved over to the same bucket we treasure, full of gems, that we're grateful to have been picked to stand up for people couldn't stand up for themselves and stand up for their rights that are in this case, that are your classic, the way life is for herniated disc case. Same thing when you say there's not a lot of visible property damage. Think about it. I hear it all the time. What, what are the odds you think that you would have an inventory of gnarled up total cars got pulled away and ended up in the junkyard in the ones you go by on the road and go, Oh gosh. Oh gosh. I hope someone didn't die. That kind of carnage crash. What do you think the likelihood you'd have a whole bunch of them in herniated disc? <laughs> Come on. That would be death cases and paralegic and quadriplegic and amputations. That's a different case. 
I'm not saying you don't have a herniated disc case with a bunch of property damage, but I'm saying you can't expect it all the time or, or regularly. It's going to be the extraordinary, not the ordinary, the normal car crash case with the herniation. There's not a lot of visible property damage. It's what it is. If you're going to do those cases, you can't say, damn it, all my cases are like, of course they are. If you don't want to do a case with not a lot of visible property damage, quit doing back cases. Do med mal. <laughs> You're going to have something tough to pill to swallow there. Those of y'all that do med mal know what I'm talking about. Hardest case on the planet to win. I sue cigarette companies. I think they're the hardest cases on the planet to try because they send such an army and wear you down with their machine they've been developing for 100 years. Their litigation machine is amazing. But to win, sue a doctor who is trying to help. They're tough. So maybe you want to keep those back cases and recognize, I don't need to feel sorry for myself because they, there's not a lot of visible property damage on most of them. Because it's the nature of those cases. And by the way, once again, the underlying premise of why it is a problem is fatally flawed, just like the gap in treatment. Why? Sneak up behind me, shove me in the back unexpectedly with my pre-existing baseline conditions. What's going to happen? At best, I am going to hurt for days. And I may end up with a herniated disc forever. Is that a stretch? No. Would I have a bruise on my back? If they hit the chair instead of my body, would the chair be torn up, broken? No. It's not about the crush of metal on a car. It is about the unexpected, awkward jarring. If it's not a neck, it's a back. It's jarred because you're in an awkward position, you're not expecting it, and you have a sudden, awkward jarring. That's what causes the harm. It's got nothing to do with tearing metal to shreds. It's apples and oranges. That's why I have this analogy. Most of you have probably heard, but those that haven't, I'm going to repeat it because it goes to, even if you have, it's to make the point it's not a problem. Anyone who's heard it and said, what a great way to solve a problem. Because trust me, I've said it that way in front of lots of people before at seminars. I'll never say it again. I'm going to say I'm fixing to show you why it isn't a problem and it never was. We were tricked into believing it was a problem. Why? Defense lawyers love to trick us into believing things are problems. Insurance adjusters love to convince us they're problems. Because if we think they're problems, they're going to get away cheap. And when we realize they're not, they aren't getting away cheap. Our client's going to get what they, I hate the word deserve. They're going to get what justice calls for. If someone came and this is the chair and you're the jury and I would turn for this, I'm not going to because oh, God knows where I'll be on the camera. You would I turn this chair that I'm sitting inside with. So I would be facing this way and the back of the chair would be behind me. The jury's you. And I say to the jury, closing argument, rebuttal. If so, you know, they keep showing you these pictures, folks, and they keep talking about them. But you know, if someone was sitting in this chair, and they had no idea I was coming and I walked across the court from the other side. And I was came at them at five miles. Let's say that everyone said the crash is somewhere between five, 10 miles an hour. Now, I don't know how fast five, 10 miles an hour would be on, 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 on in running on, on, on feet, on foot, but I know I'd be getting out of this, be running across this court. I'm not gonna run across the court in my suit in dress shoes. But if I did and I came up and now you're moving towards it and they had no idea I'm coming and you hit the back of the chair like, now, you don't make a huge deal in over theatrical, but not a tap. You hit it firmly, and the chair rocks. And I hit them in the back of this chair, and that person who didn't know I was coming went, ow, what are you doing? How fair would it be for me? And now you take the chair that was turned like here, and now I turn the back to you. Turn it around to the jury. Say, 
how fair would it be if I were to say, what are you talking about? That couldn't have hurt you. There's not a mark on the chair. It wouldn't be fair at all. Why? Because it's not about the mark on the chair. It's about the unexpected jarring that causes the harm awkwardly, unexpectedly to an adult spine. Why do I say adult spine? Because they're kids that love to sneak up on each other and shove them in the back, especially in little boys. They love to creep up on their friend on a playground and shove them. They jump off and brush the dirt off and they chase their buddy across the playground squealing. Grown-ups don't sneak up on one another and shove them in the back unexpectedly. Why? Because someone's going to get hurt. Grown-ups' necks aren't supple like those little kids. Now, when you go through the little story and you go through the analogy, it's over with the jury. It's over because it was never a problem. Because every one of those grown-ups, when you say shove in the back, people don't sneak up on grown-ups and shove them in the back unexpectedly. Everyone cringes. And when you cringe, they get it. They go, ooh, that would hurt. And then you do the chair and they go, yeah, someone did that, it could hurt. And it's got nothing to do with the mark. And the reason that analogy and that little story have served me so well, and I've had more people say, Mitnick, it's one of the best problem solving things I've ever heard in my life. And I go, thank you. And I'm proud and I appreciate the compliment. But I, I now will always say, I wasn't solving a problem. I was proven it wasn't a problem to start with. And then you add to just to make sure, because there's some jurors are going to just be wired to make it a problem, even though it's not. In jury selection, how many of you feel if there's not a lot of visible property damage, the person can't have been hurt badly, certainly not permanently, no matter what the doctors say about it, period. You made up your mind. Well, those people have made up their mind. They're biased. They can't sit on your case. You'll get rid of them for cause, but all the rest of them are fine. And you never say low impact. That's their word. Low impact means wouldn't hurt a flea, wouldn't hurt a fly. You say not a lot of visible property damage. Why? It's accurate. B, it's not a negative connotation. And C, there is an underlying potential connotation. Most, a lot of people have had a car, went to the shop, came out, looked fine, never ran the same. So you, you also may evoke, there's more there than meets the eye. So as we go through each of these, what I'm doing, I hope and pray, is I am showing you not how to fix a bunch of problems in your cases. I'm hopefully convincing you, you know what? They were never problems. My caseload just got exponentially better. And I didn't swap out one case. And that brings my joy level up. That brings my willingness to fight for my client up. And that brings my courage to go to trial on that case up. And it's the same case. That's why I'm excited. That's why I love that phrase I thought of this morning, beauties in the eye of the beholder. And the defense doesn't want me to say this. They want you to keep thinking, That's why I'm excited. That's why I've lit up our Lord. I'm driving him crazy. I'm doing in-house brush strokes. I'm talking to them because I know after all my years of doing this, this is a fundamental change in your heart, in your per perception. And, and perception is so important. Our own perception, everyone says, believe, you got to believe, you got to believe. How can you step in front of the jury and ask for full justice if you don't believe? It's true, you can't. But I always struggle with believe. And they go, oh, good. Turn the lights with, boop, I believe. Turn up and don't believe. Believe. It doesn't work that way. Belief has to be built. It's like trust. It's like love. It has to be earned. It has to be established. It takes time. I'm trying to get down to the core of believing. Believe in these cases because they're worthy of your belief. Why? Because they're not riddled with problems and you haven't been saddled with a crappy caseload. They're good cases. They just look like a herniated disc case looks. And that's what you're making your most of your life is spent on. And those people are hurt. 
And they come to you and said, I can't stand up for myself. You stand up for me. And now you can stand up taller because you look at their case in a different light. And it's the same case. And you weren't doing anything wrong yesterday. You were just doing what everybody's doing. But if I can turn a little bit of light on this and everybody go, I do feel better then it will be one of the most substantial things I've ever done in my life because we got a lot of folks listening. Is it a cure for everything in a case? No, you're going to have cases that really are problems. I'm just talking about the fundamental core of your cases. So the next topic, and I'm not going to go to it because it, now, it, it gets too much into what I want to do in the next one of these, which is, I don't know the date when y'all send whatever you send out to everybody, will you include a schedule for the next, we have a series of these. So everybody can have some, I've had a lot of people email me and say, gosh, I wish I'd have known earlier. I, I, I got something I can't get out of. Um, and they wanted to know, can they watch this later? Yes. I sent an email. I hope y'all all got it said, if you signed up, and can attend, you will get notice in a link and you'll be able to watch it a, a replay. I always like it better live, but it just feels better to me. I hope it does for you, but you can access it. But I'm, we're gonna give you a heads up to the future ones that are coming up and the dates in advance. So, you know, if possible, and you want to, it's easier for you to schedule. I apologize, the notice went out so late. It's on me. I'm scrambling around doing a whole lot of things and I didn't get some of the content that I needed to get to the folks that are helping me with this at Morgan & Morgan. But in any event, the next one, just to preview, is I'm gonna be talking about something I call false framing by the defense. False framing, where they frame a case in a false way. By the way, everything we just covered is an example of false framing. Gaps of false frame. It's called like a, a, a straw man argument where they set up an argument they know they're gonna win, but it's a false argument. They frame it incorrectly. Gap equals your pain went away. That's a false frame. Not a lot of visible property damage. Couldn't hurt, or hurt a flea. False frame. Aggravation is a compromised case. False frame. Prior injuries. Discount case. False frame. They're extraordinary at it. The next one we're going to roll into where I'm going to switch. I'm going to keep going back. It's not a problem. But this is a whole nother subject. And that subject is my client doesn't look hurt bad. In fact, my client doesn't look hurt at all, let alone bad. It's the better way to say it. So they frame it that way. The defense frames, you don't look hurt, so you, it can't be a big case. It's probably not an injury at all, but if it is, it's a little injury. Because look, and it's a false framing because it's not an external presentation of an injury, it's an internal presentation. If I hit my thumb with a hammer, it's external. It gets purple, it looks like hell, and I yelp, and then it swole up like a light bulb. I don't have to prove to you I hit my thumb with a hammer. You can see it plain as day. This injuries are internal presentations like somebody who goes in to check the cholesterol, you can't tell from the outside. You can't judge a book by its cover with these kind of cases, but we let them get away with it. One of the big ones is surveillance. Another one's Facebook. And I'm gonna go into in detail why, A, those things aren't problems. Now, if your client's caught in a big fat lie, that's a problem, but I'm talking about, it's consistent with what they said. They just don't look hurt. Well, they don't look hurt on video because they don't look hurt walking in the courtroom in front of the jury. But we're allowing the defense, if we're not careful, to false frame it and be apologetic for it in discount our cases because it's a problem and it's not a problem. So that one we're gonna be talking about not letting them turn the inside out, not let them turn an inside assessment of an injury into it's an external injury because it's not. You can't see it from the outside. It doesn't mean it's not real. There are tests where you can prove it. MRIs don't lie is one of them. 
So the next one is going to be, don't let them turn your case inside out. I'm working on the, the at home, but not alone brushstroke for that one. I will be sending it out um, soon. I want to polish it up and get it out, but it'll be out before two in a, within a few days, but that's going to be the next subject. False framing. Don't let them turn uh, your case inside out. And it's equally to me, equally important and profound as this one. And it's just another step in the progression from all of those phone calls and all the work I'm doing internally in Morgan and Morgan to share all this and elevate us. And I'm trying to Morgan and Morgan and John Morgan has always believed in sharing our wealth. As people say, I want your forms, John, how you've done this with a, such a big firm. You know what he does? He puts it on a disc and sends it. And I'm cut from the same cloth. And I, I'm so glad he and I are equally yoked on that. We share it because we're all fighting the same common enemy, injustice, and we're all fighting for the same cause, which is maximum justice for deserving clients. So anyhow, are there any questions? Keith, we have a number of questions. Sure. Um, Stuart asks, have you ever had to prove damages in a civil rights case? If so, then how did you do it? Yeah. Um, it's funny you bring that up. I just, I told you I was expanding my telephonic meetings with lawyers into our employment department. And I've had multiple questions on, you know, a boss that treated someone terribly, um, somebody that treated someone wrong over race um, or age or gender or religion or what, or, or some horrible reason they're discriminating. And, and I just went through this and I'll give you a shorter version on this. Maybe I'll try to do one of these, you know, webinar in more detail later for folks that do more of that kind of work. But here's the gist of it. You gotta, you gotta divorce yourself from the typical physical injury that's a permanent injury where we're doing per diem arguments over time. Where you're saying, I've got this low level pain for the rest of my life and it flares up some, it's never going away. It's not interfering so much with the doing as with the experience of doing, but the experience of doing matters. And over time it takes a toll and adds up to a lot, even though it may be little in individual moments. That's a different model than something horrible was done to somebody. And the, the model in my mind for that kind of injury is dignity, respect. And if a boss or a company or a police or whoever is in a position to exert power and authority over someone else abuses that position, It may be momentary. It may be for a month or a year or one bad incident, but it lasts a lifetime because when someone, when you're helpless to fight back against an authority and you take degradation and you take disrespect, and you put up with it because you got a family to feed or you don't want to go to jail by talking back. It doesn't go away just because the moment pass, it stays with you for a lifetime. You go home to a husband or wife and they think a little less of you because you didn't stand up for them, even though they're glad you didn't because they don't want you to get fired. But it's a change in for a man, manhood, for a woman, the respect they fought for so long and hard and to be treated as if we drop back 50 years. And if we treat that as jurors, as well, it's over, it was, you know, it's just one thing, then what are we saying about the significance of that? Because it lasts, it's a scar on someone's dignity for the rest of their life. And if you're able to make arguments that are closer to punitive, where you can say, we cannot tolerate this. 
The verdict that says this was a small matter says this is okay. But if you can't do that, the same argument applies. This is not a small matter. This is important. This will be with them forever, and they ought not have been put through it. And the bully boss, the bully police officer, the bully company can't be allowed to do that to them and ignore the harm caused, nor mock the harm or diminish the harm. That's a short version of how to take something that isn't expansive time-wise, but to let the jurors recognize the depth of the harm that makes it a substantial non-economic damage. Anyone else? Uh, yep, Douglas asks, what is your opinion about deposing medical experts? Should they de be deposed every time, never, or somewhere in between? We have internal discussions on that in our office, and I'm, I'm wondering is it one of our lawyers. Um, great question. I'll tell you that the answer is it depends, um, but I will not leave it there. I'm going to give you some, what what is my what my advice to people is how to decide if it and when you after saying it depends. Here are the factors I consider. I assume we're talking about uh, the the orthopedic or neurosurgeon that defense hires. Um, to come in and say it's a sprain strain that healed up, there's no permanent injury, and that's just the aging, normal aging process. Here's, it, it depends on the law in your state to some degree. If they're required to write a report and you have some good law that says they can't and cannot expand beyond the report, then a big part of that, and if you don't, then I probably do want to depose them. If you do have that law, and a lot of states do, I know traveling around trying cases, then a big question to me is how uh, good is the report? And by good, I mean good for you. How clear, how crisp, how limiting. If it's vague, it kind of leaves the door open, then I probably want to take a deposition so they don't have a free reign. If I got a judge who's going to give them latitude, if I got a judge who's going to hold their feet to the fire, if it isn't there, you don't talk about it, those are factors. Um, how strong is the law in holding their feet to the fire? But having said that, there's a little more to it. I think it's very, very substantial to me to have them have a diagnosis of sprain strain. Not may have had a sprain strain. I want, in my, based on reasonable medical probability, they suffered a sprain strain. They almost always say that because they don't want to be heard to be saying, you made it all up. You went to the emergency room, for God's sake. You went to the chiropractor. You got MRIs. You went to the neurosurgeon. You did all these things. It's, it's a tough sell to say nothing was wrong. So what do they have to come up with? Something other than the herniated disc. So what is it? Sprain, strain. But I want the diagnosis. So if the report says diagnosis, sprain, strain, and I got a jurisdiction or and or a judge will hold them to no, not playing games, I check that off my box. I got it. If they say may or aren't clear and it's wishy-washy, or I don't think I can hold their feet to the fire to the diagnosis itself based on reasonable medical probability, then that's a reason to depose them. Why? Because I wanna stand up an opening statement and be able to say, you don't need to worry about whether or not this crash caused injury. They're gonna keep showing you these pictures, but they hired this doctor they go to all the time. They pay him a lot of money. They hire him often. They've used him many times. They got more, he's in the pipeline for more. And he's looked at all these records this high and examined my client and questioned my client. And he's reached the conclusion that my client was hurt in this crash, that those, whatever those pictures show, it hurt my client. That's his medical conclusion for them. They're paying his bills. He says it's just a little sprain, sprain. And we'll talk about why, how wrong that is. But my point now is we don't need to worry whether that crash would cause harm. It did, according to them. So hopefully we won't be hearing a suggestion. Look at the pictures. It couldn't hurt. <laughs> hopefully, well, I mean, well, time will tell. But the guy they hired, they're going to bring in here is going to tell you it did cause harm. Well, I can't do that in an opening. If I don't have them locked down, if they said may, they're going to come to trial. I said it may, but it may not have. I mean, those, those pictures really are unimpressive. I mean, you need it locked down. So if it's not locked, I don't have that gem, I'm probably taking it. Here's another one. I like asking the doctors in, in, in their depot, you're not suggesting my client's malingering, are you? 
No, wrong. Sorry, forget I said that. I said it opposite. You say, are you suggesting my client's malignant? They're hardwired to disagree with you. They go, no, because they don't think it's a trap. You're trying to make them look unreasonable. They want to be reasonable. Are you suggesting my client's malignant? No. Don't say you're not, because they may say yes, because they're wired to disagree. Are you suggesting my client's malingering? No. Move on. Because now you have the power and opening statement to say. And here's another thing you can take off your worry list. Some people sometimes in these kind of cases worry, could the person be exaggerating or faking even? You don't need to worry here. The same guy that we talked about, they spent all this money on, they use all the time, they trust, they go to. He went with my client, examined my client. One of the things he always looks for is whether they're exaggerating or faking. And he's going to tell you my client wasn't. He, they got a fancy medical word. It's called malingering, but it means faking or exaggerating. He's going to tell you in his medical assessment on behalf of them who are paying his bill, there's none of that going on in this case. So hopefully we won't be hearing any suggestion about that. Time will tell, but I want you to know what they have. That's a powerful opening. Now, if I'm in a jurisdiction or I have a judge where I feel if he didn't say malinger in his report, they're not going to let him say it then I might not take them. But it's wishy-washy. He just didn't comment on it. And one judge may say, yeah, the fact he didn't comment it on, that's not really a diagnosis. So I'm going to let him talk about it. Well, I don't want to go out on a limb and say all that. And I don't know what he's going to say. So that's a reason to go take them. On the other hand, if he blew it in his report, he does a report and he misread a record. He didn't have a record. He didn't have some MRIs. He only looked at the reports, not the films. He's got her history wrong. Something you can kill him with. And that's in his report. Well, that's going to weigh heavily on don't take his depot and let him figure it out and clean it up. We're going to write on the report. So it's those kind of things. I think in every case, you need to think about it. I lean towards taking them. But if I find they've blown it and I got a report that I can't wait to get at them, then I lean the other way. But my go-tos mildly take it, but it depends. Keith, um, there's a few questions regarding gaps. Um, what if the client didn't get treatment right after the accident? What if it took two weeks? Is that yeah. gap okay? Um, yes. it's not a problem. Is the gap for closing or voir dire? Yeah. Um, I would not do, let me tell you, let me do, if I forget it, remind me, I don't think I'll forget it, but let me, when do you do it? I'll come back to, let me first do, what about the gap, initial gap, didn't go to the doctor all the time. That's not a problem. Do we wish they went? Yeah, why? Because it's one less thing we got to address. And one less thing we got to hear a bunch of wah wah about from the other side. It's one less thing that may affect them being willing to be fair to your client and not have to, go to trial and take the risks that are associated delays that come with trial. So sure, I'd rather them go. I hear a case they didn't go. I hear a case they did go. I, and you say, which one you want to go to trial? And Nick, I'll say, I'll go on the one they went right away. Because it's just, just, I, I'm so used to thinking that way. But in my, this new vision, this new revelation, think about it. The person, what are they thinking? Here's the starting point for me always. I assume my clients are telling the truth and really hurt until something just proves me they're not. I give them the benefit of the doubt. So I believe my client is hurt. And my client did not go to the emergency room and didn't get any treatment for two weeks. There are two explanations. One is you really aren't hurt and the whole thing's bogus and you're making it all up or something else happened two weeks later, you're hiding, or you really, really weren't hurt and you're, someone told you, go, hey, make it all up and you can make a bunch of money. And one explanation. Or my client was hurt, but they weren't paralyzed. They didn't have a broken bone. They weren't gushing blood from the gash on their forehead. Their car was drivable. They were shook up. And they thought, I got to get to work. I got to get pick my kid up. I'm all right. I don't feel good, but, you know, I'm going to be banged up and sore, but I'll be fine. 
and they went on about their business. And when they didn't get fined, like they expected to get fined, they said, damn it, honey, I'm still, you better go to the doctor now. Now it's a week. You better go to the doctor. Well, now it's 10 days. Honey, I want you to go to the doctor. This ought to be getting better. It's not, it's getting worse. All right, now I got to make an appointment. Is it an emergency appointment? No. How long? Another week. So now we're up to three weeks. Is that fraud? Or is that what many of us would do, including the jurors? It's life. It's only ugly when we let them turn it ugly. Is it another thing to deal with? Yes. Is it a problem that has to be fixed? It's just not. Let's say your client does go three weeks later, ends up getting an MRI and there's a damn herniated disc and you've got that increased signal that tells you this is an acute injury. This has happened you know, in the last several weeks or six weeks. What's wrong with that case? You've got MRIs, don't lie. The jury's going to see it with their own eyes. And it, you, there's findings on the MRI that show it's an acute new onset injury. And your client is going to tell them it hurt ever since then. And I didn't go because I didn't think it was a big deal. And when it didn't get away, I went to the doctor and I still didn't think it was going to be a big deal. I went because my husband or wife was just telling me I need to go. And I was thinking, yeah, maybe they can do massage therapy or something. And the last thing I thought I was going to find out is a herniated disc, and I was going to have this the rest of my life. What's wrong with that story? Now, you may have to try it to get full value, because I'll tell you who's going to think that's the end of the world, be all, end all, the defense. You know when they quit thinking that's the, the be all, end all, when you go whoop their ass a few times on it, and they go, <laughs> we, they realize they're looking at it wrong, too? So, no. Would I rather them go? Sure. Does it make it a, a, a damaged case, a, a, a compromised case to be in the discount bucket? Nope. Oh, the other question is when do I do the gap in treatment stuff? Um, I typically do not do it in more dire. It, there are certain things that are too case specific, I'm sorry, fact specific. And you get into it and you get questions. Well, how long and why and what? And you can't answer them. So now you put a big spotlight on an issue that you got nothing out of it. You just ended up and the judge says, move on. You can't get it. So it, I don't see how I haven't come up with any way to, to board dire it. And frankly, I don't think you need to. Um, I hit the gap, start hitting the gap in treatment and opening statement. When I do my, though, this is part of what's in the book. Anyone doesn't have the book is this section where you do in context versus out of context, where you tear them down and, or you can do it just in telling your story. And you're going to see my client had hope. My client went to the doctor over and over. And you know what? Every time she went is, was, you know, half a day off basically and went over and over and over. And you're going to hear from her because she had hope of a cure. And then she found out there wasn't a hope for a cure. And she, and she got on with life because, you know, she could go and, you know, make them feel better for a couple hours or a day, but she, she couldn't do a half a day anymore. So she stopped. And she got on with life and living with it. And she was hoping there was going to be a cure, but there wasn't. And then you're going to find when we got close, you know, over time, it started taking what we taking a toll on her and trying to get by without it. Doesn't have the time to go, but did go back. Cause it was like, I got to get some relief. I may not keep going forever. I got to get some relief. And besides we're getting close to trial and da, 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 da. So I, I do it in opening, not more dire. Great. Hi Keith. How would you address situations where the client is involved in two incidents that are close in time? In my case, a client had a trip and fall and about two months later, a car crash, sustaining, sustaining pretty much the same injuries. Um, can you ask a question back or I'll ask you a question back and they can email you the fact. I need a piece of information for answer. Which, are you, which case are you looking to deal with it on? The, the earlier uh, trip and fall, slip and fall or are you representing them in the later car crash? And is there any change in MRI? So one, type that up. Said. 
answer, but let's move on to something else while, he, while we're waiting for that, if there's another question. Sure. How do you handle the argument that there should be no injury to the plaintiff since the defendant was not injured? Um, yeah, someone's making that argument. Ooh, that's a desperate defense lawyer. Um, I, I tell you, how I, 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 I've never crossed that one, um, heard that one. Um, that's so asinine. But I would, um, my argument would be, you know, in jury selection, I would say, how many of you have had uh, been in situations where yourself or you knew someone and there was a, a, a crash and one person was hurt and the other wasn't? You're going to hear tons of people. Yeah, I was in my son was hurt, I wasn't. I was in my, my husband was, I wasn't. And I'm, I'm not talking about the extent of injury, I'm just talking about hurt at all. Yeah, he had a sprain, strain, and didn't. Um, and I'd say, well, the fact that you didn't get hurt and he did, did it make you question him and say, you're making it up or anything? Did you start thinking maybe he was faking it or something like that because you weren't hurt? No, why not? Let him tell you, well, and everyone's going to start talking about it. Everybody impacts different people different ways. Um, and, and I'll tell you what else I'd do. I'd file a motion in limine. There's no real, I, I can't imagine what the relevance in a prejudice outweighs probative to say he wasn't hurt, so you weren't hurt. That's not a fair, legally fair measuring step. Um, so I would try to fight it in the first place. If it came out, I'd deal with it in Bordier. dire. And then in closing argument, I'd say, you know how desperate they are. They're trying to tell you because one person in a crash wasn't hurt, the other person couldn't have been. By the way, their client ran my client. He knew it was coming. He was braced for it. He was the striking vehicle. He ran my client from behind who had no idea he was coming, was struck completely by surprise, awkwardly, unexpectedly, jarring, while the defendant saw it coming, tried to hit his brakes, and had himself perfectly braced and ready for it. And they somehow want to take someone who didn't see it coming, who was struck awkwardly, from someone who saw it come and can protect themselves. And they want to say that means A and B are the same. What else are they going to argue to you folks? Thank God we have you. Now you know why we need you. Now you can see loud and clear why we needed you. Thank you for your sacrifice of coming down here. Now, please, let's make this all count for justice that matters to every human being. Fair enough. Are these inconsistent arguments? One, gap in treatment does not mean no pain. Two, prior problem, not a problem when client never returned to doctor, so must not have been too bad. Yeah, somebody, that's a smart pickup. Um, it dawned on me as I was doing the prior, why the prior is not a problem, that if you're not careful, it could look very much like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth, which I'd never do in front of jurors. It's a quick way to lose your credibility. I will never lose it. And by the way, I believe in this is not a game. This is a calling. So we play it straight. So that is a good question. And um, let me, let me, um, let me get, I was reading something across the bottom, sorry. So let me give you the explanation for that. Why that is completely consistent. Here's the difference. Your client, and the crash you're on, went to the doctors and ended up with a diagnosis of a permanent injury and had MRIs that prove it, rock solid. You can see the, and the damn herniated disc. And that thing ain't going away. It's there forever. And the treating doctor, not someone hired, but just no dog in the fight doctor, says that's from this crash. And if you've got MRIs, which often in these cases, we've got MRIs that show the increased signal, that proves scientifically it's a recent onset injury. So they have all that, and then now they go on with life. You can go on with life because you've healed. The problem is we know as a baseline, the client has got an unhealable injury from the one, and there's absolutely no unhealable injury from the other. So one is a natural progression of hallelujah, I'm better. And the other is we know didn't get better. It doesn't get better. This is a permanent injury we're proving to you that you can see independent of my client's actions. 
So the fact that one leads to you saying, I don't need a doctor, and the other leads to you, there's nothing more they can do for me. And you have a recent MRI when they go back to the doctor after the so-called gap, and it's still there. So we know it hasn't resolved. So the difference is the underlying science and medical testimony, they go with it. You have an anatomical injury we can prove here and not there. So that's the distinction. But good question, you gotta be mindful not to allow them to talk about them close in time where someone goes, ah, oh, you, you gotta be careful not to end up creating a problem that isn't a problem by the timing and sequencing of how you talk about it and leaving out the distinction. The distinction is essential and you gotta tell that distinction to the jury because you always gotta be straight with the jury. Fantastic. So we have an answer to that previous question where the client was involved in two incidences uh, that are close in time. Um, for the trip and fall, they were claiming head, neck, and back pain. The car crash two months later causes the same neck, back, and head injuries. The first MRI was unfortunately taken after the second incident. All right, and through there, I get that. Which one is he representing on both? Which case are we asking about? In other words, is he representing on the car crash? Representing on both. Oh, representing on both. Um, well, again, I'm coming back to what I always say is you got to always play straight in it. And I don't know your law there. If you have some indivisible injury law, um, I would never want to take an inconsistent position. I wouldn't say go, you know, try one first and say it all came from the slip and fall and go try the second and say it all came from that. I just, I don't, that's just not for me. And I would never, never, never recommend that to anybody. I would try to get with the client and get to the bottom of what the difference was between the two. And I'd figure out which was causing the most as best you could tell. I'd get with the doctors. I'd get with the, you know, you only have the one MRI after the second one. I'd ask the doctor what he thinks. I'd ask the radiologist what they think. I'd ask the client about the symptoms and the experience difference. And then wherever the cards fell, whatever the truth fell, I'd put the emphasis where it belongs. And if you can't split them, I'd try to try them together. And I'd tell the jury, look, they both hurt and I'm not sure where the line's drawn. And that's why we got all you here to you know, it's, it's a tough job. I can make some suggestions, but we're going to leave it to you. But one thing's for sure, it added up to one injury that's going to be there for the rest of her life. And it happens to be there two parties responsible for it. And, and you know, let the jury sort it out. That answered my really, question. Thank you. Keith. If you can't get them together, I'd figure out which is the culprit and I'd put the majority on it. If you can't, I'd try them both and straight up tell them you had another injury and that's, that's about half of it on that one. Great. How do you deal with gaps between the clients saying it was her neck, but it turned out to be the shoulder? So the defense argues that the shoulder wasn't complained about, so no treatment on the shoulder until one and a half years after the accident. Yeah. Sometimes well, my clients keep going to the doctor complaining about a body part, and months later it turns out to be something else and not the area that they've been complaining about. Yeah. All right. That, I, because I got to keep my credibility. I'm not going to say to you on that, that's not a problem. Now you got a problem. But the, now that's a different question. Is it an insurmountable problem? The aggravation, the not a lot of visible property damage, the original gap we talked about, the gap, you know, treated and then didn't, those aren't problems. This is a problem, but it's not a problem that it goes in the discount barrel or, or I, I'm scared of it. It depends on your facts. What I would want to know is this, typically what you often hear in that scenario is look, my primary problem that was bothering me most was my neck. My shoulder was hurting, but you know what? I just thought that was going away. I dinged my shoulder on my seatbelt. The neck was driving me crazy. That's what I was focused on. But as the neck started to get better and go away, the shoulder never did. And if that's the truth, and your client can, can tell a jury, and so they believe it because it really is true, and the doctor will back up. I see that frequently. You know, one part bothers people more than other parts, so they focus on it. 
because they, you know, they probably had, they probably had all kinds, they're probably, their pelvis hurt, and their, you know, their shins. I mean, people got all, in a crash like that'll have a lot of body parts hurt. But, you know, people assume I'm not going to come in here whining about everything. My primary thing is I really think I hurt my neck. So they're obsessed on it. They're focused on it. And then you go down the line. But I can look at this and tell you this is a traumatic injury. This isn't a, a wear and tear injury in the shoulder. They look different. Let me show you why they're different. The doctor. And this is a traumatic injury. And there's absolutely no history anything else would cause it. This looks exactly like what I would expect from that kind of a crash. And the client has said that she's had those problems. The, the, my, the patient has told me she's had those problem all along. It just was not, you know, the forefront. So she wasn't complaining about it and really thought it was going to go away and was more surprised than anywhere that the neck went away and the shoulder didn't. And just to honestly deal with it. But look, that's, that's a problem that if the, medicine is there and the facts are there and the truth's there it's still a case you try with your head held high and ask for maximum uh verdict because they really were the question is were they hurt in the crash not what's the defense going to do with it the hell with them do you really think your client had that shoulder hurt in the crash and the starting point for me is i believe until proven otherwise and if you do then by god Go with the truth. Because my experience is jurors will get it wrong. Most of the time they get it right. Great. How do you prepare a TBI client for a deposition when they can't remember? And what do you do afterward when they forgot treatments and injuries? Sure. Here's one simple answer. If you know that they aren't going to be able to remember have them write it down while they got records and they're able to do it and take me in their own handwriting, bring the list with them. And when they start asking about treatment, say, have them say, I don't do, I have memory lapses and a hard time holding that dates and in, in, in sequences and information. And I don't want to miss say something to the contrary. So I brought this list with me. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read off it. Let them say no. Well, then who gives a shit? They've proven up your damages if she doesn't remember them. That's a, that's a trick question, not a look for the truth. Let them say no. And then you attach this list to the, to the deposition. You came and revealed it, and, and, and they're going to try to make them look like they're covering up when they told you I can't remember and they had a list they brought. What the hell are they going to get out of it? What can Keith tell us about how to help clients explain slash describe their injuries and its effect on their life? Perhaps he has suggestions on process, timing, reference material on this important issue. Great question. Here's something I believe deeply in. And I've got a new book I'm working on. It'll probably be next year out. And it's called Deeper Cuts. Um, and, and please don't think I won't get, if I don't have his book, I'm not going to get that one. It's the old one. I want the new one. It, they build off each other. Deeper cuts is don't eat the bruises, deeper cuts. I, the new book is going to have brand new strategies to add to the systems you need to know from the first book for trial. And then I'm going to drop those systems into the case workup phase. So you need to have known the systems. So the shift to the workup phase makes sense. And then I'm going to go into some deeper, uh, how a lot of my systems came from the mental process that creates them. So with the idea, if you understand them that way, you can do them better and it, you also can turn them into your own and morph them and you also can expand it into whole new ideas that are all your own and this thing can be organic and grow. Um, but in any event, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm in the new one, the new book is gonna be this, the workup phase and it's gonna deal with some of this, this, these very tight questions. And one of the things in there that I believe very much in is to give your client a ass homework assignment. Give them a little notebook and tell them, I want you for the next week to think of all the little things, how this affects you. I don't care how little. And then give them some examples, not to, not to coach them to say it, you want the real answers, but to give, them, so to, to, to give them a model so they understand. Say, you know, for example, I've heard from clients in the past, it impact my sleep. You know, I can sleep, but it, I have to, fuss around 
to get comfortable before I can go to sleep. And then once I do, I can't stay comfortable. I have to keep moving all night. And I go right back to sleep, but I move, toss and turn. I used to not do that. I get out of bed differently. I used to, you know, just hop out. Now I kind of get out slowly because I can, it'll catch if I don't. And I, it can bother me for days or hours. Um, I brush my teeth, you know, when I do it. I got an electric toothbrush now instead of a manual because if I get a little vigorous, I go, oh, oh, and that can bother me again for hours or days. You know, when I change lanes in the car, I, you know, I do different Not when I'm looking for a blind spot. It's different because of my neck or my back. You know, my kids, I make little choices all day long. Little choices. I never made them before. My kid wants me to swing them around. He loves it. Do I do it or not? Sometimes I do. I can do it. But if I do it, I'm risking, I'm going to be miserable for hours or days. And some days I do some, depends how I feel, if I'm feeling good or what's ahead for the day. Do I want to risk tolerating that or not? And, you know, I make these decisions, all, you know, throw the softball. Go. When I run, I like to jog. You know, I walk now, or I still jog, but at a slower pace most of the time, sometimes I really turn it on. But I know, okay, I made a decision, and this may, I may regret it, but I want to live, I want to go today. I don't want to go slow. And, you know, I do these decisions and little things all day long. And I know I, that's a baseline change for me. It's a new normal. I didn't make those choices before. You know, I make those choices so frequently now, almost it's almost subliminal. I don't even think about it. It's a new way of life for me, but I do. I don't mean to sound like I'm complaining, but it's a reality. So let me list all those little decisions. Let me list all the things that cause it to flare up and what I do to try and tamp it down and keep it more like pilot light -like pain. And what, what, and I want you to think about all day long and every time a little one does, write it. You know why? If you don't, they're going to go, you know what? Here's what bothers me. I can't golf anymore. <laughs> it's like, okay, so four hours a day on Sunday, you don't get to do that anymore. That's the extent of your injury, four hours a week. And by the way, no one gives a shit you can't golf, unless maybe you're a professional golfer. So how about listing all the little things that add up to a tremendous amount of loss that bring this injury to true life? And they're not going to do it if you don't give them some ideas of what you're looking for and then tell them, but that, those are just examples. I want the real things out of your real life. And I want you to keep this journal and I want you to keep track and I want you to fill every day up, just fill pages up with anything that comes to your mind and be aware, be thinking. It's normal for you not to think. And I know you don't want to think. I don't want you to be acutely aware of how this is impacting you. I'd rather you, you know, do the, I moved on with life thing and ignore it as best you can. But for right now, just for the next week, I need you to do it. And then you can go back to being as oblivious as you possibly can to it. And then you go through that list before their depot. Call the ones that you think are the most effective to tell their story and not the others. And then you prep them accordingly. Um, but if you just leave it to them to come in and say, here's what bothers me. I'm just telling you, people with those kind of problems, if you think about it, they're not walking around thinking about it. And they tend to seize on the more dramatic sounding, which are infrequent. And you're losing the, the truth of the impact if you don't bring them into the minutia. And they only go into the minutia if you, you ask them to go there and tell them it's temporary. I don't want you to stay there. I don't want you to focus on it. I don't want to bring your mood down. I just need this data. Great. Keith, we have time for just a couple more here. Um, so just FYI on that. If your TBI client blows a deposition and can't remember a past crash and past injuries and treatment, how do you fix the problem? Or is it a problem at all? But in a TBI case, I don't think it's a problem. I really don't. Um, I would, if it hasn't already happened, I would do my last suggestion, which is write that stuff down, um, provide it to them. If it's already happened, then, you know, you, you deal with it at trial. Look, you got to make a choice. If your state allows an errata sheet, do you do an errata sheet? I got mixed feelings on them. I've killed witnesses on the other side where they did errata sheets. I've seen my, our side get clobbered with them. So I'm not fond of them, but you know, someone with a brain injury and they can do an errata sheet and they fill in, in the deposition, you ask about these things. Um, I was unable to remember them afterwards. 
you know, looking at records and things and, and talking to family, there are a few things that I left out. Here they are. Enlist them. I'm not sure I wouldn't do that with a, um, you've got a neurologist coming in who's going to testify. It's a, a, a mild traumatic brain injury. The way it presents is memory lapse and executive function issues, but on the surface, they look perfectly normal. Um, and you laid all that out and that's part of your story. I'm not sure it's into the world to go ahead and put it in. I'm not sure it's not better to do it then, or maybe just send a letter to the defense. They know. The problem is with just a letter, it's probably not admissible at, at court. But if you don't want to do the erratic, because they certainly can be problematic, then you have your client, you know, under in, 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 in opening, I tell them. And you're going to see in this actual case how this happens. Something is simple as remembering A, B, and C. And in my client's deposition, under oath to tell the truth and trying his best to tell the truth, and you're going to hear from him. You know, just had no, when asked, what about this? It had no memory of it. When it's, you know, no reason not to tell them. You know, it doesn't change anything, but, you know, just that, that's the kind of thing we see. I'd turn it into evidence because it is, truthfully, and do it in opening. Just don't it. Put them on the stand. You know, but you got on the stand's a dangerous thing. You've got to put on before and afters and treating doctors before you put them on so they know what to see. They need to understand he's going to look normal, but he's going to screw things up. Have him out of the room when those people testify. Maybe, typically, but not always. And, and lay the foundation and let him get up there. But if you don't lay the foundation, the jury's going to say, well, he sounds fine to me. Doesn't seem anything wrong with him other than he does seem to be a big ass liar. So he, perspective changes everything. And you got to create the honest perception of the jury so they understand that's not lying, that's the, the injury. And yes, he looks normal. That's part of the horror of this injury is, you know, they got all this and people around could never tell. And that's a nightmare for them. They're walking around slow and not sharp. They used to be sharp and fast, but they're not so slow that people go, oh, poor thing. They go normal, but geez, he's a little, doesn't catch on very quick. How frustrating, how maddening. What does that do to someone's dignity, self-image? trapped into this slowness that's not them, but not enough so that anyone really knows. What a frustrating horror. And you lay all that out and you're, you're probably gonna see it on the stand. I can't prepare around this problem. If I could, there wouldn't be a problem. So. Keith, we're running short on time here. If you wanna have, provide a conclusion or Anything yeah, I'll leave with everybody. Say this at the end. Great questions, everybody. Thank you. And for everybody, I know we're all busier than hell, and I know things are coming back online, and we're all uh, got a lot of things to do. For all of those of you that took that this much time out of your busy day to listen, thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, and for those of you that are going to hear this later and couldn't, thank you for taking the time to circle back and get it. And all I ask you through all of this stuff is really spend a little time thinking about this. It's not really a problem stuff because I think it can increase your joy of practice in law. And I love what I do and anything I can do to increase the joy of brothers and sisters in arms matters. So thanks for listening.